Hey, good morning. Thank you for joining us here online. Uh, we're continuing uh, through the season of COVID to offer these online services, but last week, for the very first time since March 8th, we did regather in person. We met on the lawn, the rain held off, and everybody had their masks and stayed socially distant, but it was a sweet time of worship. And God willing, we're going to continue to do that through the summer as the weather allows. Um, and so we encourage you uh, to continue to join with us here online if you feel safe or maybe you're out of the area and unable to join us in person. Um, but for those of you that are, we continue to offer drive up spots. So you don't even have to get out of your car or just bring your lawn chair, plop it down and worship with us. Uh, we will also continue to provide resources online so you can find questions both for this message and past messages that you can engage with. Let us know how you're doing, how we can be praying for you. And again, thank you for those of you that have been able to faithfully give in this time to support the ministry of the church as we've been able to bless many in our community. So I hope you enjoy this time of worship and that we might be able to see you in person sometime soon. God bless. Good morning, Sunset Community Church. Uh, we are glad you tuned in with us this morning. Uh, we pray that you are doing well. Um, let's sing together in our homes. Um, and glorify our Lord with our voices. Uh, encourage your kids, if your kids are with you, um, and those around you just to, to lift up their voices now. Um, let's do this together. a king come let us bow at his feet he has done great things we'll see what our savior has done see how his love overcomes he has done great things he has done great things Oh, you of heaven, you conquered the grave. You freed every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken the life. Oh, Jesus, I say you, your name lifted I Oh, God, you have done great things. You come. 
conquered the grave. You freed every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken the light. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You have done great things. Oh God, you do great things. So good. Amen. I want to read a scripture for us. Um, this scripture will come from Colossians chapter 1, and Paul is writing to the church at Colossae, and he is saying, hey, we're praying for you. Um, and so I want to read that as a prayer for you, Sunset Community Church. Um, and as I read this scripture, um, be thinking about the goodness of God, his great power, what he can do, what he has done, and what he will do. Uh, be looking for the promises um, that is written in here. And, um, and, and just let's all together set our minds on the Lord. From Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So Sunset Community Church, we are praying for you that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will, that you would have spiritual wisdom, that you would have understanding so that you walk, even in this season, in a manner worthy of the Lord, remembering, remembering what he's done for us in Christ, transferring us out of the kingdom of darkness into his kingdoms, uh, into the sun, um, the kingdom of his son. May this prayer um, be ministering to you. May this song now that we sing um, just continue in this moment of worship together that we'd ask the Lord to center our eyes, our hearts on Jesus um, and to recognize he is worthy of everything uh, in every season. So let's sing these songs together. Your kindly rules shall 
battered and broken, the curse of sin's tyranny. My life is hidden beneath heaven's shadows. Your crimson flood covers me. Your crimson flood covers me. Jesus, Lord, oh, we raise the anthem, our loudest praises ring, we crown Him, Lord, next part of this song together. In all my sorrows, Jesus is better. Make my heart believe. In every victory, Jesus is better. Make my Than any comfort, Jesus is better. Make my heart believe, Lord, help us more than our riches. Jesus is better. Make my heart believe. Our souls declaring, Jesus is better. If you're just joining us, we've been looking at the book of Malachi, which is a prophetic word from God to his people. And it's important just to kind of be reminded of the setting of the book of Malachi. It takes place in the Persian Empire about 400 years before Christ. So we're talking 2,500 plus years ago. And in this setting, um, the people of Israel have been exiled from their land. Many of them had been returned back to their land and they began to rebuild their homes and their place of worship. And there's some issues. One of the issues is God had made a covenant, a promise with the people of Israel that through them all nations would be blessed. And we know, uh, us today, know that the blessing that God had in mind is that through Israel, God himself would show up in the person of Jesus. Now, in order for this promise, this covenant to be fulfilled, God 
has to uphold his part of the, the covenant promise, which is uh, to provide for the people. Uh, and a big part of this, of God's end of the covenant promise is simply making sure that they survive. If you know history, ancient Near East history, if you just even read the Old Testament, you know that Israel in the Middle East was in a constant state of chaos. There was other nations that were trying to take over, whether it be Babylon or the Persian Empire. Uh, there was uh, issues within their own society uh, that caused brokenness and decay. And so a big part of God's end of, of the covenant promise with Israel was, was making sure they survived. But more than that, God also wants them to thrive. He wants them to prosper. He wants them to be a blessing to those other nations around them. So that's God's part of the covenant. But Israel also has a part to play as well. In order to remain set apart and remain in the promise of the covenant, they need to follow God's laws. Now, these laws were put into place to protect them, to prosper them, and also to allow them to be a blessing to others. But unfortunately, God's people are continually unfaithful to him. And so this covenant is in a near constant state of brokenness, really from generation to generation. You know, we all know that in order for a marriage relationship to be whole and healthy, both people in the marriage need to be faithful to each other. But if one or the other isn't, that relationship is broken. In this moment in history, when Malachi's prophecy was given, the relationship between God and his people is broken. Not because God is unfaithful, but because his people are. And what we've been seeing as we've read this book together is that despite their rebellion and despite their unfaithfulness, God pursues them. And that's what the book of Malachi is about. It's about a God who loves his people so much that he shows up with love and with correction, with the hope of making a broken relationship new again. And I hope as you've been listening that it's caused you to see clearly the character of God and the relationship that he wants to have with you today. So let's open up our Bibles this morning to Malachi chapter 3 as we continue on looking at this prophecy together. Malachi chapter 3, and we're looking this today at verses 6 through 12. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 through 12. And we'll just start with the first two verses this morning. God speaking to his people says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. God doesn't change. Say that with me. God doesn't change. Now, why would God need to reaffirm this aspect of his character to his people? Have you ever had somebody question your character in a way that it was almost unbelievable? It was almost an insult? It made you wonder, man, if they even ever really knew you? Well, this is essentially what had just happened, and we looked at this together last week. The people, in an attempt to justify their own behavior, push back at God and make an accusation that he doesn't really care about justice anyways. So what's the big deal with their sin? So here God reaffirms his unchangeable character to them. And why is he doing this? Because they doubt him. They doubt his nature. They doubt his character. They doubt the word of God, the promises of God, the very character of God, as if they don't even know him. Now, this is where many of us, if we have a, a certain caricature of God, an image of God as an angry or wrathful God, we would expect him to respond in anger, like that Zeus-like character with a lightning bolt. But instead, God makes a plea to his people and also a promise. Look at this again in verse 7. He says this, return to me and I will return to you. This is the desire of a father who wants a complete and whole relationship with his children. They may rebel, but God pursues. They may deflect, but God speaks truth. And the plea is returned to me. And the promise is, 
and I will return to you. So God is asking them to return, and this, then, is how they respond. And this feels familiar as we've read through this prophecy of Malachi. They say, but you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not enough room to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. So God is saying, he's pleading with them to return to them, return in this right relationship, uh, uphold your end of this covenant promises. And they say, well, how do we do that? How do we return? And God's answer is you return by doing what you know to do, by following the laws of God. And the thing God points out that they aren't doing, it ties into their worship, um, the covenant, and their respect for God. And the issue is they aren't bringing their tithes and offerings to him. Now, historical context is is very important here to understand this, and really some family background, so to speak, on the nation of Israel. Recorded in the book of Deuteronomy hundreds of years earlier as part of the covenant promise with Israel, it was expected that the people would give a tithe of their produce from the land. Tithe literally means a tenth or 10%. And this tithe was in heart and practice given to God. And then it would be used in a variety of ways. Tithes and offerings would support the priests as well as be used to help orphans and widows and foreigners. And there was even times when these tithes and offerings that were brought to the temple as, a, uh, as an offering to God would be actually eaten by the very people who brought them as a type of worship feast, a celebration, recognizing that the things they were harvesting from the earth were from God in the first place. He, he created it all. They just got to, harp, to produce it and to grow it. So in not giving these tithes and offerings, which is the dispute here in uh, Malachi, They are going against the covenant relationship with God. And in essence, as we just read, they are robbing God himself. They are taking from the land and yet not giving anything back to God. So what's the result of this? Not only are they in rebellion toward God, but they've also brought a curse on themselves. In the the same covenant promise where this tithe was established hundreds of years earlier, there's also a warning that if the people don't uphold their end of the covenant, bad things will happen, a curse. And so we can infer from what we just read that that is exactly the situation they are currently in. The language used of the floodgates of heaven and the protection of the crops seems to indicate that there is currently a drought and a famine on the land. And so to a certain extent, you can understand if you're not, the land's not producing, then maybe you don't want to give as much as you used to or at all. But it's a, the result of the, the land not producing is because of their rebellious hearts toward God. God promises them that if they do choose to be faithful in their tithes and offering, the curse will be removed and blessings will come. In other words, that relationship will be restored. The covenant will be in in full effect. You know, we often read the, uh, the big and crazy stories in the Old Testament and kind of focus on those, but one of the most common themes throughout the entire Old Testament is the unfaithfulness of God's people and his continued grace on them regardless of their behavior. Now, now don't get me wrong, it's not that he tolerates it because we already know that he doesn't. There are times where he says, hey, you don't want to walk with me, then you're, up, you're on your own. And that's when disaster would usually happen with Israel. So it's not that he doesn't tolerate it, because we know he doesn't. But it's that no one, not the nation of Israel or any individual, is ever too far away from God's grace. And this is a timeless truth, not just for Malachi's time, but for ours as well. We are never more than a step of obedience and a heartfelt prayer away from the grace of God. 
The curse of sin is real, but the blessings of a life lived with God are also real. And so God asks, return to me and I will return to you. In all the book of Malachi, today's passage is one of the most commonly misunderstood and or misused verses. It's almost always plucked out and taught as a standalone message for why it's important that we tithe to the church. So it's important that we ask a couple of questions as we consider how this address between God and Malachi, or through Malachi to his people, how it applies to us today. Because remember, this was not written to Sunset Community Church, but to the nation of Israel over 2,000 years ago. We aren't under Persian rule. We don't need a temple to worship God. And the old covenant promise that continually comes up in the book of Malachi, we know that it was fulfilled in Jesus. And then Jesus gave us a new covenant promise. That's the one we live under today. So when we read scripture, we need to read it in its context, and then we need to ask, is this uh, prescriptive or descriptive for us today? So some pastors will teach this passage as a tithing passage. So hold on to your wallets. Let's go there for just a minute. You know, based on what we just read, uh, I've heard this taught as a prescriptive passage for all believers. So if I were to approach it that way, I could say, see, if you give 10% to the church, God promises you will be blessed. He even says you can test him in this. Now, what's not usually taught, though, in the details of that, uh, if you were to approach it from that prescriptive standpoint, is the whole promise of rain that comes through that and the protection of crops, which clearly, for most of us, uh, doesn't apply. Most of us aren't farmers. We don't live in an agrarian society. But God isn't saying this uh, to the people of Israel in a vacuum. Remember, there's a context here. And God is using the people's stinginess in giving, in their giving as one example of their unfaithfulness to him. And he's also reminding them of the covenant that was established between him and their nation starting way back in Moses' time. So I personally do not believe that this passage is a universally prescriptive command anymore. Um, I don't believe it's uh, prescriptive any more than, say, God's command to Moses to part the Red Sea applies to all believers. We should all go out and do that. I do think it's prescriptive for the people in this time, but it's clear from Scripture that the command to give a tithe, or 10%, is an old covenant command given specifically to the people of Israel, and it is not a binding command under to those under the new covenant of Jesus, just like many of the other laws, uh, mosaic laws, are not binding on us today. So what about for us today then? After Jesus, and now under his new covenant of grace, giving does continue. Offerings continue to be given in church settings, but it is largely centered on this new thing that Jesus instituted called the church. So we see quite a few examples of the continuing practice of giving in the New Testament, but it's not tied to the old covenant, the old Mosaic covenant, but to a new covenant of grace. And this giving, these tithes that are offered, so to speak, in the New Testament church, they're integral to the mission of Jesus' followers and their worship of him. So just a a few references real quick. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 2 says, Each one of you should set aside a sum of money. It doesn't say a percentage, but it says in keeping with your income. So as makes sense with what you you earn. 2 Corinthians 8 says, uh, For I testify they gave as much as they were able. So the people at that time were able, as much as they were able to give, that's how much they gave to the work of the ministry to, to God's people. 2 Corinthians 9 says, Each one of us should give as you've decided in your heart to give not reluctantly or under compulsion, so there's no legality there, for God loves a cheerful giver. So again, thinking of the, the, the principle of giving to the Lord through what he has given us with our income is that we're to give with, in accord with what we have. Uh, we're to give as much as we're able, although 
Corinthians 8 says sometimes they gave even beyond their ability. They gave sacrificially. And 2 Corinthians 9, again, I think that idea of not giving reluctantly under compulsion, but really out of joy that we give. So throughout Scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, what we see is that a person that is devoted to God has a heart that is generous. Jesus in his ministry, uh, actually, we see two contrasting images of this. We see this, this interaction with his followers where there's a widow that is giving to the temple. And she gives two, basically, pennies. And Jesus points out and says he gave, she gave more than those who gave out of their wealth. She gave out of her lack of, of finances. We see another interaction where Jesus, uh, a, a rich young ruler comes up to him and says, hey, I want to follow you, Jesus. And Jesus says, great, give all that you have to the poor, then you can follow me. And he couldn't do it. So these two contrasting images show a heart, the hearts that are devoted to God. And that, that the, the income, the finances that we have, that we give those to God's purposes. And when we do that, we do it in faith. We do it out of joy. We do it out of relationship with God. So no, I don't believe that a literal 10% tithe is required like it was in the Old Covenant. But yes, I do believe that as part of following God and being a part of his local church and his mission, that we're to support his kingdom by giving to the local church and other Christian ministries. And we should give generously as an act of worship and of faith. And it should be a joyful thing. So by all means, use 10% if you want to as your, as your target goal for giving. But more importantly than that, give with joy. Give with faith. Give sacrificially. And as you do that, make it another means that you're worshiping God. See, as the, old, the people in the Old Covenant would give, they were recognizing that everything that they had was given to them by God. And I pray that for us, our giving would be in the same way. So as we consider this ancient interaction between God and his people, uh, I do want to point out two truths that carry forward that are timeless principles. When our love and faith for God fades, we often find ourselves on the road that the people in this prophecy are on. In our holding back from God, we are actually hurting ourselves more. Because of their disobedience, the people in Malachi's time were experiencing drought and famine, a curse as God calls it out in the passage we just read. But when we trust God, it's most often expressed in a heart of generosity. Not just financially, but in many ways in our lives. And when we live in, uh, in this, with this heart of generosity, God is glorified and we are truly blessed. So what we see here in Malachi isn't prescriptive as it relates to the 10%, but it is descriptive of the heart we should have and the relationship God desires we have with him. And this relationship is one of obedience because God's ways are the best, so why wouldn't we want to obey them? And of faith, because he is God. We trust him with everything that we have and all that we are. The truth is God is the ultimate giver. He's our model for this. He breathed our very life into us. He sustains us by his power and grace. And he came near in the person of Jesus and gave it all, his very life for us. My goodness, what a powerful picture of love expressed in amazing generosity. As the book of Malachi has unfolded and we've seen how God deals with rebellious hearts. I want to ask you a question I've been asking myself. What part of your life have you wrestled out of God's hands? Maybe as our text led us to today, it's the area of finances. Maybe as we saw a few weeks ago, it's in the area of marriage. Either who you're going to marry or who you're married to now. You're not giving that to God. Or maybe it's an area of sin in your life that you somehow justified because you have believed the lie that it's really not a big deal. The truth is, 
whether it's the area of giving, as we saw in our passage today, or any other aspect of our life, when our hearts are rebellious and resistant toward God, we are under the curse of sin. So what is your heart position toward God and his word? Even now, as you consider that question, the Holy Spirit may be bringing something to mind in your life. And sometimes when God identifies these areas in our life where we've, that we've wrestled from him, our next thought is, I feel so powerless to change anything. What can I do? And you know what? You're right. But this is where the words in Malachi point us toward the promise fulfilled in Jesus. Return to me and I will return to you. When Jesus came on the earth, he was the fulfillment of the covenant. God come near to us. And in that fulfillment, he took on all the works that we felt like we had to do to be close to him. And he says, I've taken care of those things. I have removed the curse of your sin. Philippians chapter 2 says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So today, if you are feeling powerless to overcome these areas of sin, all you need to do is put your faith in Jesus. Trust him that he is the one that can take away the curse of your sin. Submit to him in his ways. And then know that it is him who is going to work in you to accomplish his will and to fulfill his purpose, his good purpose. So my prayer this morning as we consider the the heart attitude of the people in Israel during Malachi's time, and we see the character of God pursuing them, return to me and return, and he will return to us, that we would all this morning turn to him. And we would clearly see him for who he is, the one true God who is pursuing us in love, the one who took away the curse of our sin so that we might be whole and in perfect relationship with the Father. I want to pray for us and for you this morning to that end. Let's pray together. Father, there's, there's a both and component of this life that we live. We are in community and influenced by the culture around us, but we're also individuals that make our own decisions, Lord God. Our own hearts are aligned with either with you or against you, Father. And I pray this morning, even as we're considering that question, as I'm considering that question, what are areas of my life that I've wrestled from you, that I'm in disobedience to you in? Father, that I would let go, that I would, that I would pursue your ways. Lord, that as I step toward you, that I would feel your presence near to me. So whatever it would be this morning, Lord, whether it would be thing, the area of finances or relationships or just outright rebellion toward you, I pray that by your good spirit, you would free us from our sin. That we would say yes to you. That we would know you are good. Lord, that this new covenant promise that we live in, a covenant of grace and of mercy, would be life-giving for us. Because we know it is. So I pray for, for those that have not said yes to it, that they would today. Yes to Jesus. You have a light burden, Lord God. May we come under your rule and trust you with all that we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. Hope you have a great rest of your week.